Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here to talk about some of the work I'm doing on the more theoretical <laughs> side. So I think almost everyone here in this room today is very familiar with graphical models. There are two main ways of trying to formalize notions of structure in large-scale statistical models. The first is using Bayesian networks, which are directed graphical models. And the second uh, is using a marker front end field, which is a type of undirected graphical model. And in today's talk, I'll be focused on inference and marker front end fields. In particular, I'll be talking a lot about map inference, so finding the most likely assignment in marker front end fields. And I'll be focused in particular on inference problems that arise from tasks that are called structured prediction tasks in machine learning. So at a high level, the goal of using models such as Markov and fields is that they allow us to go from local observations to global predictions. So for example, suppose that we have some observation here on the bottom left, and we want to make some inferences about, uh, about the output of some random variable in the top right here. If we knew something about the structure of the labels here, so for example, if we knew something about the relationship between these two random variables and all such pairs on this chain, then it gives us a way of trying to take these observations potentially very far away from this, this label you care about and infer something about its value from that observation. So one uses this idea in many places in machine learning, but in particular, what I'll be talking about today is in structured prediction. Structured prediction is, you can think about a generalization from binary or multi-class classification to classification tasks involving a large number of variables simultaneously. So for example, in computer vision, uh, where structured prediction is used very frequently, uh, here in the top left, you have an example of an input image. It's a horse. And the goal of image segmentation is to output the labeling for every single pixel in the image, is it foreground or background? So for example, here in white are shown the foreground pixels and black are the background pixels. Now, of course, we could have thought about just predicting each pixel independently. Right? So maybe you'll learn a different model for predicting each ij's location, or maybe the same model. Um, but as I'll show you in today's talk, if one tries to recognize that there is some structure involving these different prediction tasks. So for example, you know, these two pixels are probably both foreground or both background. Then we could use that structure to learn from dramatically less data. A second example comes from stereopsis. This is something which uh, we as humans do really well. So we have two eyes. Uh, can everyone take their finger, please? All right, good. Um, put it like this and start bringing it closer and closer and closer. Stare at your finger and then stare far away. And you notice that your finger sort of bifurcates, right? You see, you, you see two versions of it. Um, and that's because you're getting two views of that finger from your left eye and your right eye. And your mind is behind the scenes solving a registration problem, figuring out how do you map every pixel of the left image, what your left eye sees, to what the, what the corresponding pixel is in your right eye. And we use that correspondence to get a sense of depth. So the... Um, the bigger the disparity, the closer the object is to you. Now, we might want to try to design machine learning algorithms that can do similar things. And one could imagine having such a tool as part of an autonomous car, uh, where you have, let's say, two, ca two, images, two, two cameras pointing at the car, at the, at the road. And so there, the goal is to take his input two images and to output a disparity map, where just to uh, re remove the identifiability problem that says, suppose that what we're going to do is look at every pixel on the left image and just say, what is the depth of that pixel? And that's what this disparity map is. So here it's going to be showing, uh, let's say, that the, the wider the, the object, the closer it is to you. Um, and a final example of a structured prediction problem comes from natural language processing, where your goal here is to be given as input a sentence, like John saw a movie yesterday that he liked. And we want to understand something about the structure of that sentence, something about the dependency between words in that sentence. Like we might recognize that John is the noun which is, modif which is modifying the word saw, or saw is acting on that, that noun, John. Um, a movie yesterday that he liked refers to, um, uh, refers to it's sort of the object of this action that, of what John saw. Um, that he liked 
refers to the movie, and yesterday refers to the fact that he saw it yesterday. Right? So we would like to be able to output this graph involving dependency relationships between the words in the sentence. And again, it's a structured prediction problem, because although one could think about just predicting each edge independently, by modeling something about the relationship between these edges, one can hope to do much, much better in terms of statistical complexity, the amount of data you need to learn these models. So formally, we're going to think about these structured prediction problems as having some input x and outputting a labeling g, uh, where uh, x you could think about as just a vector of pixel values. We'll take every row of this image, we'll just concatenate the rows to get that vector. Uh, G is another vector, and it's an assignment, in this case, is an assignment of labels 0, 1 for, for background, comma, foreground to each pixel. And in general, we're going to be learning a map from, out, um, from the input to an output vector of labels from a discrete set L. Now, the whole goal of this exercise is that we want to be able to recognize that the labels of some pixels are going to be correlated with one another. So, for example, if you look at this image, we want that the depth of these two pixels should be the same, and they should be different from the depth of this pixel. And I'm going to give you an example of a model in just a minute which tries to do that. So there are many possible outputs G. Uh, and the goal of inference will be to try to find the best possible output labeling for a given input. So we're going to do that by characterizing a cost function, capital Q, which takes as input the input to the prediction task. In this case, it's the input image x. And it takes as input a candidate labeling, which is a vector g. And it tells us roughly how bad g is. So, so differently, we want that this cost function should be low for a g which is a good labeling of x. And we want it to be high if g is a bad labeling of x. And then if we had such a cost function, capital Q, then we could use it for prediction by just ranking all possible g's according to Q and choosing the one with the minimum cost. Right? And that's what I mean by inference. So here we would want that this labeling g has the lowest cost according to Q. And that would be the one that we output. Any questions so far? So Q in general is going to be learned. Uh, and uh, I'll, in the next slide, I'll give you an example of how Q could be parameterized. But in today's talk, I'm not going to be focusing on the learning task per se. I'm going to say, suppose you have some learning algorithm which, which attempts to learn Q in order to minimize the prediction error according to this inference procedure I just denoted. Um, we want to understand a little bit about how hard the corresponding inference tasks are. Because as you can tell already from this exercise, there are exponentially many such g's. Sorry, uh, yeah, g's. And this prop, you know, clearly we couldn't actually just rank all possible g's by, uh, by, by minim to, to minimize this procedure. We're going to have to think about some algorithms, some combinatorial optimization algorithms for minimizing capital Q. And so the focus of today's talk is going to be on that combinatorial optimization problem, not on, the not on the learning task itself. Although they are tied. So is, you're going to have a model on how Q is given to you? Yep. Okay. Right here. So uh, the, example, the, the model class that we're going to be analyzing today's talk, just because it's the simplest possible model class for which the combinatorial optimization problem is non-trivial, is a pairwise graphical model where we say that Q is going to decompose as a sum over edges of some graph given by uh, edges capital E of local costs denoted as theta UV, which take as input x and assign for every possible labeling to the endpoints U and V induced by G, induce some cost. Right? So that's what theta uv ij is, and ij just refer to two different labels of nodes u and v. It also includes a second term, which is shown on the far right here, which is summing over the vertices of the single node cost denoted as c, which also takes as input x, and 
and for a candidate node u give uh, and a candidate labeling g of u gives you the cost of that labeling for that node. So we're going to assume that the cost function q decomposes in this way, which gives it some structure and now allows us to uh, think about learning it from, from data. So if we had this cost function q, then let's just see how we would use that for that stereo vision task, just as a summary of the last few slides. Our goal is to go from these two images to this output. We're going to do that by, gener by creating this pairwise graphical model uh, using some learned function, to give, uh, which is done beforehand, to give you these cost functions, theta, uh, theta uv, for each edge. Then we're going to do inference to, with respect to that, that objective function, minimize it with respect to all possible labelings g. And the arg min g is what you're outputting, the disparity map. The X are the two images in this case, yes. The learning is done with potentially infinite amount of data before. Potentially. But actually, you know what? Just to, just to really motivate why this is so powerful, let's think about what would happen even if you had no learning whatsoever. All right, so let's go back in time. Let's go back in time all the way to 2003. Here at MIT, Marshall Tappan and Bill Freeman, two foremost uh, uh, researchers in computer vision looked at this stereo vision task and asked, well, what would be the simplest possible model in order to solve this problem? And here's the model that they gave. It's literally this model here, okay? The single node costs have no parameters to be learned. Uh, and the edged costs will have a single parameter, wuv, which I'm denoting here as a function of the edge uv, but in fact they use just a constant, okay? Uh, or they had three constants, and I'll tell you what those were in a second. Okay, so there are going to be almost no parameters here. I'll, I'll describe to you exactly what this is doing, but the key point I'm going to make is that this is a dirt simple model which actually works really well for this problem. Okay, so the single node costs do the following. So first of all, the label set uh, here uh, is going to correspond to the number of pixels of horizontal translation from the corresponding left image to get to the corresponding pixel on the right image. So I'm assuming that your eyes are, that you're not like this. I'm assuming that we're sort of looking like this. Um, so uh, so uh, if i is equal to, so if, um, if i is equal to zero, it's saying that, let's say the top left pixel in the left image is mapped to exactly the top left pixel in the right image. If i is equal to one, there's a shift of one and so on. Okay, so this label set is going to be inversely related to the depth. So the single node costs are going to look at how different the two images are at that local location. So capital I is going to note the image intensity of the left image uh, for pixel U. And over here, we're going to look at the pixel and at the in image intensity of the right image at the ith translation of pixel U, right? So moving to the right by I pixels. And intuitively, if um, if we solve the correspondence problem exactly, then those two should be identical intensities, right? So we're going to look at the cost of this translation just as the you know, L2 norm between these two different, uh, or L2 norm squared between these two intensities. If they're the same, that's zero. If they're different, that's large, and we're going to penalize our, ourselves by that, 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 that amount. Now, now we want to put in some prior knowledge about the problem, and that's where these edge potentials come in. And the prior knowledge we're going to use is that it's unlikely that uh, two nearby pixels that are, let's say, two pixels that are right next to each other are going to translate a different amount. So our, our prior is going to be, if we have two pixels that are next to each other, um, in the left image, just so just look at the left image now, not the right image. Okay. In the left image, if two pixels that are right next to each other and they have the same color or same intensities, then we're going to um, assume that they're going to be, uh, we're going to say they're, they're likely to be the same object because they have the same intensity. And so we're going to expect they're going to be translated similar amounts. If they're translated different amounts, then we're going to put some cost to it. And that's what this wuv denotes. So if the two pixels that are next to each other in the left image ha have the same intensity, or, uh, then we're going to say that wuv 
should have a high cost to it. We'll set it to, let's say, 10. If the two pixels that are next to each other in the left image have different intensities, we're going to say that WUV is going to have a low cost, we'll say 3. Okay? So um, you can imagine some threshold for what does high and low mean, uh, and then those two values. Uh, and now we have, in essence, three parameters. And that's what's go going to define this WV. So form way, I could have written this WV as a function of x. That would have been uh, more appropriate. Uh, but it's always going to be positive, right? So there's going to be a high cost for, uh, for uh, translating different amounts, pixels that look similar, and there's going to be a low cost for translating different amounts for pixels that look the same, that are next to each other. So this is the, the whole model. And uh, if you were to use this model, uh, as I'll, I'll show you a few examples in, the, in, in a few slides, it actually gets really good predictions. As, uh, and so what's particularly striking here is that it's a really simple model. Right? If we were to put our machine learning hats on and try to tackle this problem, first thing we would say is, OK, we'll use a convnet. Right? These are images. We'll use a convolutional network. We'll, you know, to keep things simple, we'll look at a loss function, which is summing over all pixels in the image of the uh, prediction of the, of the disparity, of the error of the predictions and disparities for that pixel. Um, we'll probably share the first several layers of the network. Um, let's say all of the, con all of the filters, we'll share them across each of these pixel prediction problems so that we don't have too many parameters. We'll get a large data set of pairs of images and their ground truth TEPs, and we'll learn that function end to end. All right, so that's what we would do if we were thinking about this in the modern uh, era. And, um, and it would require data. It might require a lot of data. Now, here I just showed you an example where you could do this prediction with you know, three parameters. And you can imagine trying to fit those parameters from just one or maybe even two examples. So why inference in today's deep era? Well, the real reason is because it's going to enable learning from significantly less data. So one could imagine trying to now parameterize this. Well, rather than setting this single node cost to be this fixed function, we could let it be parameterized by a deep neural network. Rather than letting this WUV be given to you by these just three parameters, we could also parameterize that by a deep neural network. Um, except because we're using this formulation, we're starting from a place where we know that there is going to exist a really simple function, which will already do pretty well. So if you have a little bit of data, hopefully you should improve beyond that. Right, so that's the intuition. Um, and in recent years, people have been using what is known as deep structured prediction, which is implementing exactly this idea. So um, for example, for these image segmentation problems, folks have been using inference as, in essence, your last layer of a deep neural network, uh, where it, it implements that idea I just mentioned. So your deep neural network gives you your potential functions, which is then used with this inference procedure to make your prediction. And there are many ways to try to, try to do that. You could think about inference as some black box. You could also try to think about a particular approximate or heuristic inference algorithm, and in, s in some sense, um, directly do end-to-end -end training where you try to, um, uh, where you could try to optimize your predictive performance with respect to that particular approximate inference algorithm. So for example, if you're using belief propagation for approximate inference, you could actually view every iteration of belief propagation as a recurrent neural network, which is on top of this convnet, and then do end-to-end -end training. And that, that's what these authors are actually doing. One could also try to use inference within the network, rather than just as the last layer of the network. Uh, and, and that's been a common theme in the, last, in the last one year in the machine learning community. So for example, um, in this really nice work from uh, Amos and, and, and Coulter at Carnegie Mellon, they showed how one can solve these very small Sudoku problems by incorporating, in essence, a quadratic program as an inner layer of a deep neural network. And then the later layers of the deep neural network could be understood as trying to interpret the result of that inference procedure to, um, uh, pro properly. So just to conclude with this motivation of why inference is still important in this modern deep learning era, it's because inference, I believe, will be a major component in, uh, in, in deep architectures. And they're going to be key problems that we, the inference community, need to answer in order to understand how to properly use them. For example, what are good inference algorithms? 
Uh, if we're going to be using approximate inference algorithms, as I'll discuss in the next, for the rest of the talk, uh, what are the structure of good approximate inference algorithms? Uh, how can we train these end-to-end -end models with those approximate inference algorithms as part of them, and so on? So that's all of my motivation. So now let's get into the, some of the, the theoretical details. So the first comment I want to make is that map inferences in general and p-hard. So by map inference, I mean this minimization problem, minimizing this cost function capital Q. And nonetheless, what the community has found over the last couple of decades is that heuristic algorithms tend to do pretty well for these problems. So for example, if you look at this stereo vision task for precisely that cost function I showed you earlier, the ground truth depth map for this, these pair of images is shown here. And if you were to use that simple model and you used an approximate inference algorithm, in particular one that's called alpha expansion that I'll define for you in a little bit, it gives you this output. Now let's compare these two. They're pretty close to each other, right? So we don't know whether the errors from comparing the ground truth to what's predicted are due to the model or due to the approximate minimization of this cost function. But altogether, they're still doing pretty well. If you look at this foreground background segmentation problem, you take a simple model for that. Um, I'm not going to define it for you. And you used, if you used a uh, linear programming relaxation to solve the corresponding, approx to approximately solve the corresponding combinatorial optimization problem, and then you rounded, what you'll get out is this prediction. Again, you can see that it's very close to that ground truth. So the question that I would like to try to address is why? And there's been very little work in the, uh, in the inference community to try to understand why is it that these heuristics work well for real world instances. Uh, and so today I'll be talking to you briefly about three attempts at trying to answer this question of why these heuristic inference algorithms seem to work better than their theoretical uh, worst case. Uh, the first approach will be specific to binary predict uh, structured prediction problems, such as that foreground background segmentation problem I showed you earlier. So here in this, in this, in this work, right here, we're assuming the labels are, are binary. The cost functions are going to be parameterized in the same way I showed you earlier, where you have um, some, uh, some cost for assigning two uh, edges, uh, two labels uh, on an edge, different uh, values. And for here, I'm going to allow that the Ws are arbitrary. They can be either positive or negatively signed. So a balanced model is one where if you were to create, if you were to look at the signs of W for every edge, so if this edge, if the WV here is positive, we'll put a plus here. If the WV here is negative, we'll put a, neg a negative here. A balanced model is one where there's no odd signed cycle in the graph. So if you were to you know, look at any cycle in the graph and, and count up the number of uh, negative edges, uh, it, it's always going to be even in a balanced model. Is that definition clear? So it's well known that a particular linear programming relaxation of, this, of the corresponding inference problem here is tight for balanced models. And for those of you who are familiar with the Shirley-Adams hierarchy of, of relaxations, I'm talking about the first level of the Shirley-Adams hierarchy. But what if the model is close to balanced? Like, what happens if, there are, if there's a single odd sign cycle in the graph? Well, let's look at this example that I showed in the top left, this particular example. Um, and I'm going to now take a learned model for doing image segmentation. We're learning on a different data set. This is a held out image. And I'm actually going to look at those potential functions. So, I'm going to be coloring every edge in this grid structured graph blue for edges where the corresponding w is much larger than 0 and red for the corresponding edges where w is much less than 0. 
And I'm not coloring it if the, if the edge weights are, are, some, are less than, have a norm less than some threshold. So if you look here, so the red edges are the ones that introduce the negative signs. And you'll notice that there are very, very few negative edges here. In fact, there's some negative edges which are sort of surrounded by nothing. And there are a couple of negative edges, like right here, right there, which are surrounded by these, these blue uh, edges. And you will, you will get these uh, odd sign cycles here. So this is not a balanced model because of, for example, these things that are going on right here. No, no. The LP relaxation is general, and it applies for anything of that. You know, any. It'll. It'll. You could write it down for any cost function of this of this form. Uh, but it's a good question because, uh, for example, later LP that I'll show you, I'll write the form which is ex sort of makes use of the, the the structure. Here we don't do that. The, the relaxation in this setup is just simply it's between interval zero, one, or rather than zero or one. Right? Correct. So if there. So to be clear, if there was only a single, um, okay, so, so this is not quite, this is not a balanced model by any means, um, but I want to argue that this is an almost balanced model. Yep? We're talking about the model, but this is an output of running an algorithm on the mean. Yes. So which, so I guess maybe it would be No, no, this is not the output of, of an algorithm, no. This is what I'm showing you here is actually the model itself. So, so if you look at this objective function, where these theta u, v, and c's, these are functions, which take as input some x. In this case, this is the x. And it outputs an objective function, which you will then minimize in order to get your prediction. What I'm visualizing here is the objective function itself. It seems like sort of this objective function must be learned by looking at lots of horse images. Correct. It's, it's learned by looking at lots of horse images. And I'm, I'm going to be looking at the objective of a new image that was not in the training set. I'm not going to tell you anything about how this was trained, but just suppose it was trained well. Right? Still, it's a value of a function. Correct. Particular values of x, you know? Correct. Yeah. So Correct. Correct. So I could have showed you a corresponding uh, plot for a different image. I'm showing you this plot for this specific image. Right. What are the G of U and the V in the plot you need to show? Um, the, the, the pixels, are, the label set is all binary here. This, this is, is for a hypothesized label set. This is for a, a back, foreground background segmentation problem. Yeah, but what is G? But what is G? Is it, is it a hypothesized segmentation problem? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually showing you what the argument G is here. Yeah, I'm, pl I'm plotting W. That's yeah, exactly so right. G is not fixed yet, right? G's, well. Uh, not in that picture. That yeah, no, in this picture, I'm not telling you what G is. I'm not telling you what G is, I'm just telling you what the W's are. Excuse me? And W is local? W is, is local. Yeah, W is, is defined between the edges and the graph. So I'm, I'm, I'm plotting. Basically, I could have put a grid here, and what I'm coloring the edges of the grid. Sure, it's an edge detector, right? Yeah, it looks a little bit like an edge detector. Uh, there's, you know, there's there's something which I've done, which 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 I, I think is what Polina might be uh, recognizing, which is that I've in order to try to make this figure look as nice as possible. I have behind the scenes uh, done some uh, uh, permut permutations, not permutations, but um, flips of the label space. So this objective function, um, if, if, I, if I, for a given pixel, if I called 0, 1, and 1, 0, the objective doesn't change. But the figure will change. So for example, um, if you have uh, blue, blue edge, blue edge, blue edge, blue edge. There's no, nothing to draw here, so I can't draw it, but oh. If you had, if these were four red edges, saying that uh, all of these endpoints, 
all have different values from this endpoint. So th for example, if this was 0, 0, 0, 0, and, and uh, um, uh, this is 1, um, th then what, I'm do what you can do actually is you can imagine just permuting it where you call this 1, 0. And then these what were red edges will now look blue. Uh, and that's without less of general. It doesn't change the objective function at all. It's just there's a, there's a uh, um, uh, the objective function is identical. And if you were to minimize it, you'd get the same value out. But if you could just call 0, 1, and, and, uh, and 1, 0, and, and correspondingly, uh, in essence, permute it, change this potential function, so you get the same thing out. So I've done some of that in order to turn, like, in order to turn most of as many, in order to make this look as empty as possible. But it doesn't change the objective function at all. So this, this preserves like the oddness of all cycles? Correct. It preserves the oddness of all cycles. Exactly. So I, I've done that behind the scenes. I don't want to dwell on it anymore because it's, it's not important to the talk today. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here, the only point I'm trying to make, is that this is not an adversarial instance. Okay? It's actually quite a nice instance. If this was all blue or all empty, then, uh, then this would be a balanced model. It's not a balanced model. It's something that's somewhat close to a balanced model. Um, and in fact, I would, define something, I would define an almost balanced model here uh, to say it's a balanced model where if you were to remove a single node and all edges incident on it, if the, the resulting model is balanced. Okay, so this is my definition of an almost balanced model. And technically speaking, this is not an almost balanced model, but it, it's close to it. Uh, and what we proved is that the second level of the Shirley Rams hierarchy uh, also goes by the name of the cycle relaxation, is tight on almost balanced models. So intuitively, what this is saying is, well, maybe your model isn't perfect. Like, your model doesn't always point in the direction of the ground truth. Sometimes your model is, is imperfect. Uh, sometimes there's some uh, ambiguity. That ambiguity might lead to a slightly hard inference problem. But as long as it doesn't happen too frequently, a slightly more powerful linear pro program relaxation is going to be tight in this instance. I'm not going to give you a proof of this result, and neither am I going to argue that it's a particularly strong result, because notice I only said the word a single node. Right? A stronger result would, would, would allow you to either remove lots of nodes, say you allow a lot of these red edges, such as we have here, or it would use some other structure of the instance to, in some sense, build upon, you know, pa allow pasting together of many results of this sort. And we don't have such a result yet. But this is one path forward. It's one approach, which is try to say, okay, you know what? Uh, even though these, this, the, the simple linear program relaxations uh, don't always work for these real-world instances, there is another relaxation. In particular, this is the relaxation which, um, which uh, a lot of the uh, empirical work found very good results on. There's this other relaxation, this one, which is tight on those instances. So it's a step in that direction. There, just to clarify one thing, I'm, I'm sure Tim will have questions, but it's sort of related. Yep. So this was all learned on one image. That's the entire thing. No, no, the, the, the model was learned on other images. The, so the, the functions, these thetas and Cs, were learned on other images. And then I'm going to but take I this. You were displaying theta here. I'm, I'm displaying theta for this specific new image, which is in the held out set. Oh, so that's, that's the value of the function. That's the value of the function that I'm plotting, exactly. But theta doesn't depend on x. Theta does depend on x. It depends on the input. It doesn't depend on g. It does depend on x. Oh, theta as a function does not depend on x. The, but I'm, what I'm visualizing is theta of x. Yes. Thank you, David. Uh, can you give us a sense of how it depends on x? So the simplest way is to look at the single node costs. So the single node costs, um, you know, for example, since if this is trained on a, ho on a horse's data set, then we might have some idea of what horses might look like. And so if you, you, know, if, if you, if you imagine this looks locally at a, at a, at a pixel, and to say, sort of, tell me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this should be. Thank you. So, so you could. This uh, it would be w x comma u comma v. Is that what your question was? Yeah. Yeah. You could write. Yeah. X comma u comma v here. Okay. 
Yes. And I'm visualizing W of X coming to you come of E. And so then when W is one, it wants to see dark going to light? Yes. Like yes. And well, you're, we're, min we're minimizing this. So it, it wants white go to white. Because we're minimizing here. White go to dark. If, if this is, one, it is very large, because we're going to be minimizing this cost function here, it's saying that we want them to have the same value. Because right, you're, you're multiplying it by the indicator of i not equal to j. Yeah. But you have the right intuition. And so then I don't understand why in the next slide it's inside the horse, it's not all blue. And that's because I did this flipping argument that I said. There was, there, you can always do a permutation of the label space sure. in, order to turn, in order to make it look, in order to, in essence, get rid of a lot of the blueness. And I've done that permutation. Um, I, don't want to, I, I really don't want to dwell on this anymore. We can talk about it later because there's a lot more I want to get through in today's talk. Uh, and this is not important for the rest of the talk. So you can now forget about everything I just said. <laughs> and Polina, you and I can talk later. Okay. Um, my point was just that would be one viable route to try to understand how to push forward uh, uh, to ex better explain real instances, which is to show that more linear programming relaxations are tight than we previously thought. But that was also a very restricted instance. Like, for example, it, it looked at um, just uh, a binary segmentation problem. Now let's look at this other uh, stereo vision problem that I started out with in the very beginning, where now the label space is non-binary. In this instance, the inference problem uh, uh, goes, it, so this model is equivalent. So once you have uh, th this model with fixed cost and weight vector is equivalent to what's known as a ferromagnetic POTS model. And the corresponding inference problem is NP-hard in the worst case. Now, there are a lot of known approximation algorithms for this type of instance. So for example, uh, you could use a linear program relaxation where you do a, a relaxation, then you round. You could use an algorithm called alpha expansion, which is defined shortly. And both of these are known to give you a two approximation in the worst case to that objective function. Right? So the solution of that approximation will give you a g prime, which has a factor, which has an objective function q of g prime, which is a factor of two, multiplicative factor of two from the arg min g. Yes, we're minimizing here. So, but when, we, when these algorithms have been applied on real instances, the predictions are actually really quite good. Uh, there's no reason why in a two approximation objective value should actually give uh, argument predictions which, are, which are, are very close to the, uh, to the optimal predictions. Right? A, a multiplicative factor of two is quite large. And so these approximation guarantees don't explain really anything of what we see in, in the real world. What I'll be doing over the next few minutes is showing how, in fact, for suitably nice instances that are called stable instances, uh, these algorithms don't just give you a two approximation, but in fact, they optimally solve the instances. Um, so, for example, for that stereo vision problem, if th th this is the, um, the optimal solution, I'm calling it the map solution, but it's the, it's the arg min of G solved with CPLAX or Gorobi, so an int using an integer linear programming solver. Uh, and if you're to use a linear programming relaxation uh, and round, this is what you get out. Uh, and you can see that it's really quite similar to the previous instance. So in order for the statement of the result to make sense, um, I'm going to be making a statement about both the linear program relaxation, which I think most of you are familiar with LP relaxation, so I'm not going to show you that. But I'm mostly going to be making a statement about a different heuristic algorithm known as alpha expansion, which I don't think any of you are familiar with, so I'm going to tell you about that now. So alpha expansion is a heuristic algorithm widely used in computer vision for solving precisely this type of uh, optimization problem in these ferromagnetic POTS models. It's a local search algorithm. It starts by initializing 
a labeling. Um, so we'll let f be some initial labeling, like all zeros. Then it's going to, every step of the algorithm is going to make some change to that labeling. And, it's going to, and every change it makes to the labeling is going to be decreasing the objective. So uh, it'll, it'll make some changes, it'll decrease the objective, it'll make some changes, decrease the objective, and at some point it'll get stuck because none of the changes it considers are going to decrease the objective and it terminates. Conceivably it'll terminate at some local optima. So the changes that it makes uh, are given to what are the, called these alpha expansion moves. In particular, for each possible label alpha, so you should think about alpha as a disparity amount, like zero means don't translate any pixel, any, any distance to the right, one means translate one pixel to the right, and so on. So for each possible label, we're going to find the optimal alpha expansion of this original labeling f. And we'll call that new alpha expansion h. If q of h is less than q of f, we keep it. Otherwise, we go back and we consider a different labeling. And if we ever find a labeling which decreases the objective, we continue, we iterate. If no labeling improves the objective, you terminate. So let me, I have to define for you what an alpha expansion is. In, in binary case, alpha is 0, 1. So you have two options. Correct. And then you call it 1 expansion and 0 expansion, or it's just a sort of a, correct. A bad use of notation? No, no, that's the correct use of notation. But in general, when, when, it's not, when, the, when the label space L is not just 0 or 1, but arbitrary, this is what an alpha expansion is. It, it starts from F and it says, we're going to, for every random variable, we're either going to keep it at its current value or we're going to consider changing it to alpha. Right? So for every, um, for every uh, U, if f of u is already alpha, then h of u is also alpha. Um, if h of u, if you're going to change h of u to be something different from what f of u was, then you have to change it to alpha. You can't change it to something other than alpha. So if you look at this example, suppose that your initial labeling is 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, and we're, trying to, and we're considering a 3 expansion, this would be a valid 3 expansion, where we choose these two variables and we, f and we change their values to be 3. But you can change multiple. But then it's not multiple. Uh, well, so it's, you can think of it as they make these global moves, but they're very restricted. We don't consider all possible global moves. We only consider moves that are these alpha expansions. Zero, 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 one is still exponentially many possibilities. It's exponentially many possibilities. You should worry about that. OK? We'll talk about that. It depends on how many variables you choose. No, even if they're, oh, sure. But let's suppose you can, arbit you can change arbitrarily many. So there are, He's right. There are exponentially many possible moves here, and we'll get back to that. Won't hold, hold that thought. This is not a valid alpha expa a three expansion because this middle variable we're changing to two. Right? We're only allowed to keep the same value or move to alpha. So is the implication that for, for this task you want to move sort of large batches at once to a different depth? Correct. Right. Correct. Now, uh, getting back to your point about there being exponentially many. Notice that at each point in time, to find the best alpha expansion, meaning to search over this exponentially many possibilities, they're, all, they're only, to be clear, even for a non-binary problem, there are only two to the number of, of random variables possible alpha expansions, because we're only keeping or changing. And it turns out that for this cost function, you can actually optimally solve to find the best alpha expansion using the st min cut problem. Um, because of the structure of the instance. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to, to convince yourself of that. It, it, it should be, it's straightforward. So it can be done in polynomial time to find the optimal alpha expansion. But there's no reason in general why making these local, I call them, they're, they're big, but still local moves are, would ever reach the global optima. Okay, so alpha expansion is ridiculously fast because you can implement st min cuts really quickly. Uh, and so, for example, this is the alpha expansion solution uh, to that instance. As you can see, you know, it's, it's getting uh, ballpark reasonable results. And here's what it looks like in practice. So what I'm showing you is every step of the algorithm. I'll run through that one more time. So each, each slide, each, uh, each anim part of the animation is a different alpha expansion move. 
So in order to try to explain why uh, these linear program relaxations and alpha expansion work, we're going to use the notion that's known as stability. Intuitively, stability is going to capture the intuition that the ground truth stands out in some way. And there's been quite a bit of previous work using stability to explain why some combinatorial optimization problems might be solvable. Uh, this, this notion was introduced in work by Ballou and Lineal for Max Cut, and there's been several other uh, results, for example, on clustering-like problems uh, by Nina Balkan and her students. So we're going to ask, can we give a stability result here as well? And the tuition is that what we found from a number of, uh, of, of uh, empirical experiments was that the instances, the, 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 op the arg min solution doesn't really change much if you were to perturb the edge weights. And the stability is, notion of stability is going to capture that intuition that the argument solution that I'm that, that's also known as the map assignment will only change slightly under small edge perturbations. So formally, a beta gamma perturbation is defined as follows. Given some weights w, a beta gamma perturbation of w is another weight function w prime such that for every edge uv, W prime is upper bounded by gamma times W and lower bounded by 1 over beta times W. So for example, this would be a valid 1 comma 2 perturbation because for no edge is W decreased, right? Because beta is 1. And uh, for every edge, uh, th the edge goes up by at most a multiplicative factor of 2. And recall, we're using, we're using uh, this. When I'm referring to w's, it's this w. So I'm assuming that the cost, edge cost function is parameterized like this. So we call an instance beta gamma stable if for every possible beta gamma perturbation w prime, G, the previously optimal solution, is still the optimal solution. So consider this instance uh, where the edge costs are given to you by these, uh, the numbers 5 and the single node costs are given to you by this table. The argmin solution here assigns label 3 to all three of the variables. Uh, and this gets objective value 8 because none of the edges are cut. And if you look at the node costs, we're going to sum up 0, 8, and 0. Now, this is an example of a 1, 2 stable instance, because if we were to multiply any of the edges by any constant larger than 1, the argument solution is still going to be 3, 3, 3. In fact, it's 1 infinite stable. But it is not 2 comma 1 stable, because if, for example, we were to divide each of the edges by 2, and resolve, we would get back out a different assignment. Now v is 2, u is 2, and w is 1, which has a lower objective value. Uh, one can see it has a lower objective value than 3, 3, 3. So in the most recent work, uh, led by my uh, student Hunter Lang here at MIT, and with my colleague Arvind from Northwestern, we showed that the first level of the Shirley Adams hierarchy for, this for these family of instances is tight on all 2, 1 stable instances. The proof idea is to show that, suppose for purposes of contradiction, that the linear programming relaxation was fractional as opposed to integral. We would use stability to construct an integer labeling that violates, sorry, what, what would you, suppose, suppose that the solution was fractional will show that one can construct an integer solution that violates stability, thus contradicting our assumption of stability. The way that we do that is by using a particular rounding algorithm for this linear program and the probabilistic method to show that there exists a, uh, a, uh, a labeling in the support of this rounding algorithm which has better objective value than, um, than it should. But Stability is a very strong notion. And it's conceivable that for many real world instances, hold your questions because I, I want to make sure I get through this. It's conceivable that for many real world instances, 
the map assignment might change a little bit if you were to perturb the objective. However, intuitively, there might be some stable set of nodes which does not change even if you're to do a, a, a perturbation. To capture this notion, we introduce this idea of weak stability, which says that now we're going to have beta, gamma, and a set capital S. We'll say that for every, an instance is weakly stable if for every beta gamma perturbation of the objective value, and here we're only, we only need to ever perturb the edge cost. We never need to talk about perturbing the node costs, which is the best possible result. Then the cost, if you ever find that the argument, uh, if you ever find that a labeling h under the perturbed cost has a lower cost than g, I mean, lower is better because we're minimizing here, then it must be the case that H is consistent with G on that stable set capital S. It can, it can vary arbitrarily outside the stable set. So this is the definition of weak stability with respect to the set S. And of course, if S is equal to the set of all vertices V, then, this, these, then weakly stability, weak stability is the same as strong stability. What we showed is that alpha expansion, this heuristic algorithm, always recovers the optimal solution on the stable set if ever you have a 1, 2, capital S, weakly stable instance, where capital S is denoting the stable part of the instance. The proof technique is relatively uh, uh, complex. Um, and one of the interesting aspects of the proof is that it actually, despite the fact that alpha expansion uh, doesn't have a linear program in it at all, the proof technique actually uses a linear programming re relaxation as part of the proof. The goal of the proof is to show that as long as we're, go we're going to analyze alpha expansion iteration by iteration, every iteration is going to be making some change to the current solution. And what we will show is that as long as the current labeling does not agree with the optimal labeling on the stable set, then, then each iteration of alpha expansion is going to strictly decrease the objective. I'm going to finish it. So the way that we show that is we take the current solution, the current integer uh, 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 solution, at, uh, at some intermediate step of running alpha expansion. We're going to construct a modified objective function as a function of that current solution. Then what we'll show is that one can apply a rounding algorithm on that modified LP relaxation. And that rounding algorithm is only ever going to be searching over expansion moves. We'll use the same sort of technique as earlier to show that if, as long as the instance is weakly stable, something in the support of that randomized rounding algorithm must improve the objective function. And because that randomized rounding algorithm only ever considers expansion moves, and because alpha expansion finds the best possible expansion move, then alpha expansion must also improve the objective function. So just to summarize what I've told you about stability, I, showed you that, I told you that the linear program relaxation is tight on two one stable instances, and alpha expansion uh, is tight uh, on these weakly stable instances, which are 1, 2 stable. And it's quite curious that it actually changes, where the LP works well if you have 2, 1 stable, and the, L and the alpha expansion algorithm works well if you're 1, 2 stable. That's very counterintuitive. I would have expected that both algorithms would work in the same family of instances. Um, of course, you can intersect the two, and you see that both of them do work if you have 2, 2 stable instances, which is a, which is a stronger assumption. Um, so one of the open questions here is to really understand, well, why is it that there's this gap between what these two algorithms can work well in? And well, by the way, we have, ca have counterexamples of, uh, that the other one doesn't work in those instances. Um, another really intriguing question raised by this work is, what is it about the energy landscape of these stable instances that allow that alpha expansion algorithm, which is, which is doing this local greedy optimization, why does it, what, what, it, what, what is it about the energy landscape that always reach the, the global optima? So um, with that, I'll conclude. Um, I described a couple of instances where inference is easier than its theoretical worth, uh, worst case. 
I believe this is very important because it will allow us to design better inference algorithms by better understanding what is the structure of real wood inference techniques. And it will give us guidance about how we can try to combine inference algorithms within, um, within larger machine learning systems. Uh, and there are a number of open questions which I'll just leave here and I'll finish now. Let's say, for example, the instance where LP is tight, um, and let's assume it's binary setup. How terribly does max product do? At least in empirically. Um, intuitively, max product or suitable variations of it works very similarly to linear programming relaxations. Yeah. So you can dampen max product, and, and what you get out is very close to solving the local relaxation. So all of my statements about the first level of the Shirley Adams hierarchy is going to be comparable to what max product will work in. But for example, max product will not work well, or I don't think will work well, for these almost balanced instances, where you need to go to the next level of the Shirley Adams hierarchy. So then I would say that I would sort of change my force and force vector graph. Yeah. And then. Yes, you could do that. Great. So th that's, the, that's a gaping hole in my current analysis, which is that I, I argued we have em empirical evidence to suggest that stability is a reasonable notion for these instances. But I haven't shown you here, at least, that these real instances are actually stable. Um, one stepping stone along that, or one challenge to solve, is to come up with an algorithm for certifying stability. Uh, we've done that. So we have an algorithm um, which runs in exponential time. So it has to solve an integer linear program in order to certify stability. Uh, you can put that integer linear program into, uh, into Groby, and actually you can solve them. So, so that's not an, uh, an obstacle. Um, what you find when you solve those integer linear programs is that the instances are not perfectly stable. Uh, so the, that's to say, there, there exist perturbations where the new solution differs from the original solution in a few nodes. So the next natural question is, well, maybe they're weakly stable. Uh, but unfortunately, certifying weak stability is much harder. And so we don't yet have a, a, a very good way of trying to find that stable set asset, something we're actively working on now. We did recently. Yeah, yeah. You, you're checking stability with respect to the worst case possible. Correct, so with respect to the worst case. Well, but the result holds for, so in order to sh say that, that, uh, that, this, that the alpha ex expansion will reach the global optima on the stable set S, one needs to sh show that the instance is stable to this worst case perturbation, right? So I would like to, I would like to have a, 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 a result that actually does hold in, in that nature. Um, and I do think it's achievable, actually. So. Uh, so I believe that these instances are close to stable. Uh, we have some slightly different techniques now where what we've been able to, uh, unless is Hunter here, he's not here. His latest result as of last week is that we can prove that 20% of the labels will always get the right value. And so we have, a we have a certification of that. But of course, I would like that number 20 to be 80. OK, so in the interest of time. Yeah. Your questions are a bit longer, so we should take them offline, maybe. <laughs> 